Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Real Talk. It's Lucas here, and I hope that today's episode informs and inspires you to have your own real conversations. As always, today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Trivan, maker of trucks, trailers, and enclosure buildings tailored to your needs. Be sure to check them out at trivan.com. A huge thanks to them for sponsoring the show and making it possible. One other quick note before we get into today's episode is that if you are willing and able, if you could leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on any of the podcast networks or platforms that allow for it, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that will be much appreciated as it helps get the word out there and lets people know what we're all about. So with that in mind, on to the episode. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Real Talk. I am joined today by Mark Penninga, who last time he was here was uh, here on behalf of ARPA and now is here on behalf of Reform Perspective. So uh, what gives, Mark? What's what's happened in the meantime? What's going on? Yeah, well, Lucas, it is great to be back on the show. Yeah. I love it. I still listen to it regularly. I did also before the switch. Um, what gives? Yeah, last time I remember sharing the story of ARPA. Mm-hmm. ARPA has been near and dear uh, to myself, to my family, to so many of the, the listeners I know. Um, then about uh, two years ago, um, it was also around this time where I'd written that book, Our God Moves Mountains, that we had chatted about. And I saw that ARPA was in very good hands, obviously in the hands of our Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the organization was just very healthy, very strong. And I thought it was good time for somebody else to take my role there. Part of that is motivated by my family. I've got six kids. They need um, a lot of energy and attention and my own health, uh, mental health, and just strength to be able to carry on. Our sure. role was a, a big, big, heavy uh, commitment. And then at the same time, um, Reform Perspectives, an organization that I've been involved with in some ways, uh, both on the board and volunteering for years. And it was evident they needed some real help. They were at a crossroads and I thought, okay, here's a, an opportunity to help a good organization, but also an opportunity to, to do, accomplish something that I've been hearing a lot from, uh, when we toured the country for our by year after year. And that is where can we go for, um, a Christian perspective on current events on mm-hmm. the news and, Reform Perspective had already been doing that, and we saw a huge potential to um, expand that, improve that. So that's what we've been doing over this last year or two uh, with Reform Perspective, and it's been a real joy. Wonderful. Well, happy to have you here. And um, yeah, we'll get to the topic at hand. Uh, Just for listeners, later on in the show, we'll touch on at the last portion for about 10 minutes, just the story of RP and what Mark and the team have been able to accomplish over the last uh, two years or so. But uh, in the meantime, speaking of current events, one of the most pressing events of our time is uh, declining birth rates, declining fertility rates. And uh, Mark is here uh, in Ontario, and that's why we're able to have him here in the studio in person to uh, to give a series of talks, just two talks on um, yeah, declining birth rates and, and, and the flip side of that being God's call for us to be fruitful and multiply. So do you want to tell, uh, tell us a bit about why you're here? how this topic kind of came up and and why are you specifically speaking on this topic? Yeah, it, it's been probably a 20 year um, story, a culmination of 20 years of, of uh, looking at this topic, both academically at first and then more professionally, and also just seeing it play out in the lives of my family, my friends, church community, just society at large. Uh, so when I say academically, it started with, I did some graduate studies focused on the topic of human dignity in Canadian law and society, focusing on life issues. So in in the Canadian courts, that's things like abortion and euthanasia. But obviously at the heart of this is fertility, having children, the gift of life. Um, It shifted more to a professional role with with my time at ARPA. Um, The you know, the work that we've done on those fronts on both ed- ends of life, preborn life and and um, those who are facing terminal illness and other health struggles. Um, now, at the same time, you know, as a young adult, I was married at around age 25, um, grew up or at that time was in the Fraser Valley in southern BC. A lot of our friends were getting married yeah, around age 25, sometimes later, closer to age 30. And just noticed that 
things are shifting. There's uh, something different than than a generation or two ago. Um, couples are waiting longer before they're getting married, uh, and then they're having generally fewer children. Now, this is something that um, over the last couple of years, God has laid it on my heart to study it more, um, also with a view to how is this impacting the Christian community specifically. And I've come to the conviction, and I'm open to being shown otherwise, uh, that the lack of children in the world, the, the decreasing um, fertility rate, will probably become the greatest challenge that this world uh, is going to face in this this next century. So um, obviously, I don't know the future. I don't know what the Lord is going to bring to this world. There might be other challenges and other forms. But the thing with demographics is you can see um, what's going to come, what's around the corner, just based on what's happening right now. So there's a degree of certainty when you're dealing with demographics. And the fallout of the lack of children is so significant that I think it's going to be one of the most pressing challenges. I'm not, I don't mean to say the most pressing challenge, but one of the most pressing challenges. And then in light of that, where does the church fit in? And uh, I see it as one of the great opportunities uh, for the church. If we welcome the gift of life, uh, as God has called us to already back in, in the book of Genesis, I think we can have such a beautiful impact in this world, much in the same way, actually, that the very first century Christians did um, in the Roman Empire. Uh, when the Roman Empire was declining, Christians were, were welcoming children, even abandoned children. And we saw a huge um, turnaround. We saw Christianity explode throughout throughout that uh, part of the world. So I see a, a huge opportunity if the Lord uh, allows it uh, for us to cherish life and, and be a real light to our neighbors by doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's many ways we could go on this, I suppose, but I'll, I'll just say I for sure see the trend around me as well. Just speaking to, to the, yeah, friends and, and people around my age, getting married, having children, whatnot. There's definitely much more of a delay. And then even just interacting with just people generally in the world, I find that a lot of people don't, even if they are dating, like there's no uh, inclination towards marriage anytime soon. Like it's this just far off thing. Like I just recently spent some time with some some people who were, yeah, not exactly from the church and at a, at a various wedding, uh, in a wedding setting. And yeah, a bunch of them were dating. I was like, oh, cool. You guys are going to get like married eventually. Like oh, three, four years, like who knows, whatever. We'll see where it goes. Like it's this kind of thing, like maybe when I'm 30. We'll think about it then, but there's like, there's no urgency there at all. What do you think is driving that? And do you think, is it a case of like, if it rains in the world, it drips in the church sort of thing? Like has this been a, a slow trend towards less and less uh, children, less and less marriages mm -hmm. or delayed at least? I've learned to answer this question actually requires a, a lot of data, it requires a lot of, uh, th th there's many angles, many prongs that all intersect. Um, Part of it is just practical. And uh, so with industrialization, it used to be that families required a lot of children just to help out. They, they lived in a more rural setting. They had farms or they, um, they just needed the help of their children. And obviously that changed in the last century, two centuries, and they've left um, the rural areas, headed into the cities. We've had um, machines able to do of a lot of, of what kids used to do. And so just from that practical perspective, there was a shift. But um, when you look more into it, then you see that it's not so much practical reality. It's, it's a heart, heart issue. It's a, a mind issue. It's a change in worldview. And, um, and yes, there, I do think it is a case of where if it is a challenge in the world, it's going to be a challenge in the church, not just because it drips in the church, but because um, the church is made up of broken, sinful people, just like out in the world, and the same um, pressures that we face are common to all to all humanity. Um, I, I recently read a book uh, by Carl Truman. I think it's quite well known, Strange New World. Mm -hmm. And I know he's popularized um, something that he calls expressive individualism. And so that's a term I think that he's come up with, at least that, that he uses, uh, to describe how people in our culture today are working through big decisions, working through um, really prioritizing their lives. And 
by expressive individualism, he means that we are um, finding our identity based on our feelings. So you be you is very much an expression of the things that that you care about. You don't let any others get in the way. You can decide for yourself uh, what you're going to look like. And obviously this, this is manifested most strikingly with issues like transgenderism, that even if you're a guy, if you want to identify as a girl, go ahead and, and do so. But it's, it also manifests itself in, in much more subtle ways that um, if you were someone who's decided you want to just explore life, then go ahead, explore life. So the sentiment you just shared from, from some of these friends, I just was on the plane yesterday coming over here and the, the young fellow beside me is 25 and he shared the same thought like, yeah, maybe, maybe when I'm in my thirties, yeah. I'll, I'll settle down, have some kids and I've got a lot to do before then. So I like the idea of, of family maybe down the road, but I, I sure have some other priorities. So it's, it's this very individualistic um, approach that we define for ourselves how we're going to live. And in that respect, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> this yeah, is something yeah. we've, as humanity have, um, when we go our own way, then it tends to be quite of a, an individualistic approach. And it's a, a huge contrast from what God has shown us, how he wants us to live. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So you have the technological component. There's less of a need there. And then in that space, the heart of man comes into play. And like, if we serve ourselves first, then we're thinking, ah, let's put off kids. We don't need them as much. And then, yeah, obviously with the uh, birth control and whatnot too, there's a lot more freedom uh, or you know, freedom, I guess, is somewhat of a way to describe it in terms of controlling that. Yeah, it's, it's quite striking. Carl Truman also does a good job of showing the impact of technology where um, people's worldviews ha had already changed in much of the world, um, going well before 1969. 1969 in Canada is when the federal government legalized um, birth control and abortion. And um, what that did is, yes, the, the prevalence of birth control use obviously increased. And if you look at the fertility rate in Canada, it is striking that it's right around 1969 that you really see it drop. And um, so the technology allowed people to live as they actually wanted to live. And, and I think the same thing is happening now with the internet. There's a increasing, um, like this individualism is leading people to have lives that are more and more separate. They're on their own more and more. Their interactions are, are virtual. And I just wrote about the, the popularity of AI girlfriends, so artificial intelligence girlfriends. Oh, yeah. Yep. So guys, young men are having less and less sex. Um, just in the last two decades, it's, it's amazing how much uh, of a, a decrease they're reporting. And part of the reason is they're finding uh, everything that they're looking for online. And artificial intelligence is, is making that a whole lot easier. So that's just one manifestation. But, but what Truman shows very well is how um, the worldviews had already changed. It's just that in many cases, people weren't able to live as their sinful hearts wanted them to live. And something like the birth control pill um, allowed people to have sex without the consequence of pregnancy mm -hmm. by and large. Yeah. Well, and a recent example of, of the people's hearts changing before the law change would be um, marijuana legalization in Canada, right? It was, that's a widespread thing, very commonplace. And then we changed the law and, and that was that. And now it's more commonplace to a degree, but yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Um, so on this topic of over, uh, or sorry, on um, fertility and population decline, um, you see this as a long-term trend. We see, we see this as a long-term worry. I mean, you're on the same page as Elon Musk, so potentially you're you're in the right spot there, at least in terms of uh, looking at future threats. Um, many, many people will say, well, the world has too many people in it and we have a risk of overpopulation. Um, is that true or where are those people coming from and, and why do these uh, seemingly two narratives that, that would clash, why do they exist and, and where is the truth in, in the middle of that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a fascinating question because if we do look around us, we see a lot of people and we're dealing with things like housing shortages yeah. and oh. so many immigrants that have moved into Canada. It seems like there's people everywhere. 
Um, if you look at a graph that shows world population over the last five plus thousand years, it's really striking because that number is very low. Uh, so 200 million or so for much of human history, uh, all the way till the time of Christ, it's pretty much flat, like steadily increasing, very slow, all the way up until the 1800s. And from the mid 1800s until today, there is a huge spike in, in world population. It's um, in my presentation, I can actually show you. So you see how dramatic it is, but it almost looks like the line is on the bottom of the screen the whole way through human history and then yeah. shoots right up to the top of the screen. Yeah. And while well, what contributed to that, it wasn't that people were all of a sudden having more children. Rather, it was that um, thanks to advances in technology again, uh, medicine, agriculture, uh, people were living much healthier lives. And it used to be very common that um, children died in infancy. So a mom would have uh, five, six plus children, and then some of them would die before they were one or two or five or six. And I think if we have genealogies, um, I know when I looked in my genealogy, you see how just how common that was. There's so much infant mortality. So in those last 200 years, that wasn't happening. And it's amazing how quickly then the population increased. And yes, that did cause real concern. It was especially in the 1960s, 70s um, that, that the concern was popularized. Um, there was a just a recognition that how is the world going to feed? How is the world going to sustain such an increasing population? And um, I have some quotes that I, I use in uh, my presentation where they make some of these dire predictions. And I, I find them striking because they sound a lot like some of what we've heard today about climate change. Uh, it didn't, wasn't there a famous bet? Uh, I forget the guy's names involved where the, he was like, okay, like we're going to run out of food by 1990 or something. And Yeah. 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 Dr. Paul Ehrlich, there you go. Yeah, he was the, the main um, <laughs> spokesperson. He wrote this book called uh, The Population Bomb. Yep. And, uh, he said he made a lot of predictions. None of them were true. But what, what shaped his, his thinking, and it's quite understandable, is he made a trip to India and he walked through those slums and he saw all those kids and he was uh, repulsed. Like he, he couldn't stand the sight of all these kids. And he thought, we need to make sure this doesn't happen in the rest of the world. Uh, he claimed that um, already a long time ago, the, the population of the United States would drop to 22 million. He said that life expectancy would be at 42 years. Um, just it, it from his perspective, it made a lot of sense. And I would say when we do make predictions just based on um, what we see with our eyes, so just the, the hor looking on the horizontal instead of the vertical, looking to God, then it does make a degree of sense when you see that population of the world spike the way it does it feels like that line's going to just continue going up and look there's limited space this is definitely going to be an issue now um, dr ehrlich was wrong on a couple of fronts first of all he's obviously <coughs> wrong about the population of the world increasing it's it's going to start decreasing um a little bit later this century uh but but he was i'd say more fundamentally he was wrong with his view of what human nature is. Uh, so when we look at Genesis, we see that God created male and female in his image, in the image of God, he made them. And uh, he did so as the, the crown of creation. So when you view humanity as the crown of creation, then you can trust God that he's going to design creation in such a way that this is going to work. His mandate to us, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, that this, this will work. God's ways always work. Um, and, and instead, Dr. Ehrlich viewed us as a kind of parasite, something that has to be limited. And you see a lot of that kind of talk with, um, I'd say, flowing out of a Darwinian view of, of, of um, humanity. If you believe that we are the products of chance, then it makes sense that we have to take measures just like we do if there's a, a species that's getting out of control, then maybe we need to cull some of the wolves in my area. There's too many wolves that are killing oh, really? the moose. So we'd get paid to to shoot a wolf. Really? Um, now they look at humanity as not all that different than the animals. So, hey, maybe it's not such a bad thing to limit the numbers. Um, of course, he's wrong. 
uh, fundamentally wrong. And, and now, like you mentioned, Elon Musk, even the secular leaders have their eyes open to the fact that not only are we not having too many people, we're going to have too few people mm -hmm. and this is going to be a big reality soon. Okay. All right. That does, that sounds like a problem. How are we going to deal with this? That, that is the question that comes to my mind immediately. Like, yeah, how do we go so wrong and how do we correct it? And could it be corrected like soon enough? Like that's, that's kind of what I'm wondering, I guess, like when is this decline supposed to start happening and is there time to make a change? So the, um, there's uh, a Canadian author who, who writes actually for the Globe and Mail, um, Ibbotson is, is his last name. He co-published, uh, co-authored a book um, and he explained, essentially refutes Dr. Ehrlich's predictions. And this is much more current, just, just up to a couple of years ago. And yeah, he's the one who looks at all the data and says, even the United Nations agrees that the, the world's population will start decreasing, he says, in probably two to three decades, give or take. Now, it depends on how quickly fertility rates decline. Mm -hmm. um, I think we first have to establish, you know, is this actually a problem? You say it's definitely going to be a problem, but I, I think for a lot of people still, both Christian and non-Christian, they don't recognize this as a problem. If, if the world had fewer people, it'll just go back to what it was like in the 1900s. Why is that an issue? They would say. Yeah. Or, what are some of the ramifications? Like I've, I've, my mind immediately goes to like economic, like you, you're not gonna be able to fulfill all those jobs and the services, but there's probably a lot more at play there too. Yeah. It, it's, I find really striking just looking at the aging population. So it's, uh, it, it, just looking at who's in the world today, we know that the number of seniors is going to double uh, within the next two to three decades. So picture um, another 1.5 billion seniors. And then at the same time, if you look at how few children are being born, uh, then it's going to be far fewer people in the workforce and far fewer people in the age group that's um, yeah, coming up with labor income is, mm -hmm. is how they would define that. Uh, so uh, there's a, a chart I have in the presentation that looks at how between the age of 20 and 60, you're generally making labor income before 20 and after 60, you're not. Um, and then our, the, the, the amount that we typically spend through our life, the, our cost, so to speak, um, it only increases as life goes on. So actually after 60 is where our greatest um, expenses come from healthcare and from uh, living and, and, and other needs. Uh, so it's quite striking that at the age where we have the greatest costs is also the population that's going to grow by far the quickest. And the age that contributes um, income into the economy is the, the population that's um, decreasing. So then that, that's quite a gap. It's called, they call it a birth gap. You can measure how many 50 year olds there are on a certain year versus how many newborns there are in a certain year. And um, in the United States in 2020, I believe the girth, birth gap was 13%. So 13% fewer children. In Canada, it was around 27%. In some countries, we're up to 80% of oh, a wow. birth gap. Like Northern Europe or something like that? Uh, th that was Korea. Oh, okay. um, but yes, a, a lot of European countries. They're all in the same boat. Okay. There's, there's no, um, there's no European country, I believe, that's above re replacement level. So, um, just to, for the sake of our listeners, to to go to the fundamentals, in in order to sustain a population, you need two point one children per woman. So that's one one child to replace the mother, one child to replace the father, and then point one children to uh, replace those children who don't get to be old enough to, to reproduce themselves. So that's, that's the current age. It, it, in times gone past, it would have been a higher number just because right. of infant mortality. Yep. Um, so 2.1 is, is the number to always pay attention to. And if you look at fertility rates around the world, it's really striking how um, they used to be between five and six worldwide on average. And then they've plummeted first in Europe uh, and then North America. And you see in North America, you have this jump back up right after the second world war, the baby boom. Yep. Uh, and, but now if you look at the continents of uh, Asia and Africa, the decline is just as much. It's actually faster, the, the decline in those countries. It's steeper if you look at the graph and 
and it's more recent. So um, Africa has had a higher um, birth rate for for many years, and now it's it's plummeting very quickly. And I think that's what the United Nations and that's what many others didn't expect. They they thought that some of these regions in the world would just keep producing children for, for many years. In fact, we kind of rely on that from an immigration perspective. Yeah. Uh, but so that that does tie into the the second con- consequence. It would be economically anyways, is um, we're used to uh, <laughs> bringing in a lot of people to help us out. Canada in the last year, a million immigrants. Yeah. And it's going to have a huge impact when these countries like China and India and others um, are realizing just how big of a problem this is. Uh, if we want to look at a real life case study, just look at China. They have had a one child policy for 35 years. It was so effective that their fertility rate was down to 1.1. And um, it was just in the last few years that they've realized, whoa, we actually need more children. So they've changed it to a three child policy. And uh, I have a Chinese friend and I asked him about that. And he said, you know, for a lot of my friends in China, they look at that and they they just snub their nose at the Chinese government. They say, you've told us all along that we can't have children. And now you're telling us we have to have children. Fat chance. We're not going to bother. You know, we're not interested in this. And uh, if you look at the, the population projections for China, um, this last year, the population started to decrease and it's, it just dropped significantly in the few, next uh, number of decades. So they're their, their ambitions of being this this massive world pop, uh, power, you know, taking over the United States in terms of impact in the world. The number one reason why this is looking less and less likely is because they didn't welcome the gift of children. They purposefully mm-hmm. um, made that very, very difficult. So, yeah, I think China is actually a good picture to us and to the world of, of what happens when we have so few children, but it's around the world now. It is um, every continent. Canada dropped again this last year far more than they expected to around 1.4 oh, wow. uh, fertility rate. So it's, it's, a, it's a worldwide issue. Wow. And that's even including like a lot of like new immigrants and whatnot, I'm sure too, who would have probably on average more children than typical Canadians. It's, it's quite striking that, um, I remember looking at this topic about 10 years ago and at that time, a lot of Canadians said, well, you know, Muslim countries, like they're still having a lot more kids. And, and, uh, if you actually look at the data, uh, Iran, for example, yeah, it had a fertility rate of around seven. Now it's 1.8. So in un- 10 years? Under, um, no, it, uh, 10 years is, was when we were looking more, just more uh, struck by what impact it could have in, in Europe and right. in North America and so on. I think it was a span of about 20 years where it decreased like that, but just, just dropped. So below replacement rate for a country like Iran, which is obviously Muslim yeah. through and through. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think the Western world realizes just how um, successful the efforts of, you know, the, all, the, all these worries of the 1970s and just how impactful, I guess, not successful, impactful that um, population controls and birth control and all of that has been. Is that a function of the rapid spread of technology of those, what you just mentioned, birth control or like just abortion for a lot of things too? Like if we're honest about how many millions of kids that kills every year and then also uh, maybe culture too of this, like the, the expressive individualism we talked about earlier that can spread very rapidly through the internet. So is that contributing to like countries in Africa who are like, oh, okay, the young people are growing up and they experience like Western culture. And they think, oh, I don't want to have as many kids. Or I want to go to school. I want to experience this. Is that uh, is that at play? Yeah, I think you're onto something. Uh, I would say it really goes back to Genesis three. Our nature is um, left to ourselves is to be quite selfish. Um, and I'm I don't mean to suggest that the decision not to have children is necessarily selfish. To be clear, if listeners are late, are thinking, "Wow, Mark is saying the only right choice is to always have." children and more children. That's not what I mean. Um, but I, I do believe that God understood very well that having children is a, a beautiful blessing, but also a great sacrifice. You're devoting your life to caring for, for this 
um, little entity. It needs a lot of care. And we humans are naturally, um, ever since the fall into sin, very self-inclined. And so um, the very first words that God gave to us, if you go back in scripture, it's like, what did God say to us first? It was this cultural mandate. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He, he emphasized this right from the beginning. And he ties this to us being made in the image of God. So here you are, you're not like animals. You're this crown of creation. Now go, be fruitful. And, and I'd say for much of history, um, this has been a challenge. Uh, it's not necessarily something new. I, I uh, was reading a book on, on the flight over about the Roman uh, Empire, the Roman times. And they, as, as Rome declined, they had the same struggle that people weren't interested in having children. They were interested in having sex and lots of that. Um, they weren't interested in having children. So yes, you're right. Abortion is, is one um, thing that contributes to it. They estimate about 73 million abortions in the world every year. But I do think that um, far more children are um, not being born just by willful prevention from people throughout the world who don't want the burden, the responsibility of having children, or they say they want it, but just later. It's always later. Yeah. And then you run into this tragic case of a lot of women want to have kids when they get into their thirties and it gets more and more challenging too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was struck too by the fact that um, by and large family sizes aren't decreasing so much around the world. And you might say, How's that possible? If family sizes aren't it's decreasing, zero. how is the fertility rate? But yeah. yes, yeah, the issue is that it used to be one in 30 women were childless. Now it's one in three. Uh, yeah. So far more women are deciding they're not interested in having children. Yeah. Yeah. I think Peterson had a podcast on this a while back too. That they went into this whole like, yeah, it's it's involuntary infertility basically. You didn't, you're like, oh, I'll do it later. And then you run into problems in your mid to late thirties and mm-hmm. that's tragic. Um, are any countries taking steps or any sort of actions to promote um, yeah, children and larger families? I know, I think Hungary is taking some steps in that direction, but any anybody else doing that? A quarter of the world's countries, when I last checked, have uh, what they call pronatalist policies. So these are policies just to encourage their population to have more children. And it comes in a variety of forms. Um, sometimes it's just cash. So in Russia, you get paid if you have a child. Right you on. get paid a little more if you have a second child. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us wouldn't mind that. Yeah. Um, and in Korea, I know that's where I identified the birth, the massive birth gap there of about 80%. Um, they've spent 200 billion just in the last couple of decades trying to ha- encourage their population to have more children. Uh, but what's striking uh, throughout the world is that there is no case where governments have been successful in turning a fertility rate around. I heard that's dead. That's very depressing. There, yeah. They, you can spend as much money as you like. You could put out all the commercials you like. Uh, but it, it, to me, it underscores again, the fact that if people don't want to have children, um, and if technology allows them to follow their hearts, then, um, they're not going to change their plans. You know, they have one life, they're going to live that life as they want to live it. Um, so yeah, it, it also, uh, underscores to me, and over this last number of years, as I study this issue more and more, it underscores to me just the importance of awareness, also for the church and and really for policymakers, for for leaders, for for everybody. Because if if any single country can't turn it around, and if we see now um, so many countries in the world that are below replacement rate, what does that tell us about what the next century is going to look like? Um, it means that. I believe anyways, that we're going to have to deal with cities that are shrinking, essentially becoming ghost towns. Um, And I don't think most of us have ever experienced anything like that. We're just used to everything growing all the time, lots of work, uh, and it'll be a very different, very different world. Yeah. Like shrinking GDP, that would be, it's just a permanent recession because you can't have growth if you don't have enough people. Yeah. And we, so we've talked a bit about the economic fallout, but, um, we need each other to care for each other. So 
generally, if, if grandma needs help, you know, with her iPad, for example, who does she go to? Probably a younger her, person. Yeah, yeah. Her grandchild. Sure. And well, that's something pretty minor, but what if someone is going through depression or has a terminal illness? It's their family that comes around them. You need multiple people. Yeah. yeah. And what we're seeing in, in places like in um, Korea is there's six great grandchildren for every 100 um, great grandparents. So if you have a hundred people, I say, try picture this on one side of the room, a hundred great grandparents all lined up. Yeah. How many great grandchildren do they have between them all? Six. And, uh, I, we're used to family trees going the opposite direction, yeah. you know, six it's great just, grandparents sh- and a hundred great grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. This is the opposite. Now who's going to care for those great grandparents and, and you know, the cold and the uncaring government. Well, I don't think they're going to have too many resources at their disposal, just based on what we talked about earlier. Yeah, there's no tax base there because nobody's working and we also support people who are retired. That's, yeah, that's going to be a big, big problem. We're going to build out like all this housing that we need right now and then we won't need it again in 30 years. I mean, Canada might be different. Play some parts of the world. Um, it will obviously be attractive for others to still come here. So yeah. I, I, I do think we're not going to experience it the way that other places will as quickly. And when I say next century, I, this does take some time before we really experience um, aging. It's, uh, yeah, it's over the course of a lifetime and then a number of generations. But I do think it will start to become much more real to the population at large in the next 20 years. Um, already now we see it a little bit with just the, the lack of workers. Yeah. Um, but, but I think it'll just feel a whole lot more real when they realize, Hey, some of these countries aren't going to be so thrilled to send their population over to Canada. <laughs> to yeah, help us out. Keep people. Yeah. 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 The pressures we see today, like in certain sectors or wherever, where there's not enough workers, that's just going to continue to spread across all the different sectors of the economy. Whee. Okay. It's, uh, it's a dark picture, Mark. <laughs> Where's the church come in and how can the church help in this? Like what you mentioned, it's an opportunity for us as the church. What do you think we can do in this in this circumstance? Well, it's I'd say it's never a dark picture when we um, keep in mind that, that vertical outlook. Remember when I said, if we're just looking side by side, the side to side, the horizontal, what we see with our eyes, then yeah, you're right. It, it can be a bit um, depressing. But when we remember that this world is in God's hands, he always uh, protects and upholds his people. He, he never lets his creation go. Uh, then we can, I think, have a firm confidence in the future. Um, there's a, a Lord's Day in the Heidelberg Catechism, and it asks, what do you understand by the providence of God? And uh, the answer goes along the lines of God's providence is um, his yeah, the mighty power as we're with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creation. So that, and then it lists a number of things, but also fruitful and barren years, um, riches and poverty, health and sickness. Indeed, nothing comes by chance, but by his fatherly hand, nothing comes by chance. Um, so yes, the world is, is likely going to experience the fruit of its choices. Uh, our generation is going to experience the, the loneliness that comes from being close to having children, I think. And yet, um, through all of this, through this world right now, there are hundreds of millions of Christians who uh, haven't followed the, the trajectory of the rest of the world. Um, they still welcome uh, children as a, a gift from God. And uh, I, that's where I see the amazing opportunity that uh, it was around 1970 or so when, when John Lennon sang his, his song, um, Imagine. And, and obviously he, um, Lennon had a very different, uh, imagination than what we would have. He, mm-hmm. he imagined what would the world look like if we didn't follow God? He thought it'd be so freeing. And, and I think that generation as they age is experiencing it's actually quite sad, quite lonely, quite depressing. But I would say we Christians can take a page from his book and say, imagine the world if we would welcome the gift of life with open arms. Imagine this world in a hundred years if if Christians faithfully did this. If we raised children, if we if we had children, then raise them in the fear of the Lord, and they had children raised them in the fear of the Lord, we could have a monumental impact uh, throughout society throughout the world. Um, the 
the shining, smiling faces that are lighting up the seniors as they go by, the little kids, will by and large be Christian kids. And to be clear, my, my point is not at all about outbreeding other religions or um, having children for the sake of numbers. That's not my point. Rather, um, from, from Genesis right through Revelation, we see that God's, God works with his covenant. God gives um, the gift of, of life um, through, through new life. So he gives the gift of spiritual life, I mean, through, through biological life. So he gives his covenant blessing to believers and their children. And already in Genesis 3, God's promise in response to the fall into sin was that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So there too, it's, it's a promise based on fertility. Um, so I, I, I have great hope that the Lord still holds his church. He always will. And, and if we as church are faithful, then um, this world can see a, a very positive light shining through Christian families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we as a church are faithful, I think that's the crux of the matter right there. I think there's a um, yeah, a tension at, at play in the church today where, and I talked about this with Reverend Ethan on our latest episode a bit, we got into it because he's very pro- uh, fruitful multiply he's <clears throat> he both on the podcast and outside the podcast too he's he's always talking about that and just oh how many kids are you gonna have and very you know very positive about it but just mm-hmm. like wants to wants to see that call put out there and and uh, make sure everyone is aware of that which which is a good and fine thing to do but i think there is a pressure in the church and we talked about this on that podcast um, between internal mission and external mission and I think there is a larger uh, segment or a growing segment, let's say, within the church, in the Reformed churches, who says, well, we should like limit the amount of like kids we have because if you have a larger family, that's more of a time commitment and there's less time for outside mission and bringing new people into the gospel. But And, and this is maybe me reading between the lines there, but my reading of what you just kind of said is God uh, grows the church through his covenant promises th- to his covenant children. That is, I dare say, his primary method of growing the church. And then the, uh, the external side of the mission, reaching out to the lost, is a secondary part of that. Very important and should not be neglected, but it should not be that we neglect the internal mission of the church. And, and that is being fruitful, multiplying and having children for the sake of going after the external side of things. Because uh, just as a logical strategy, I don't think it makes a ton of sense. And then I also think biblically, biblically uh, the, the order of those commands, I think, comes first internally and then externally. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you see that as a tension in the church? And uh, do you agree with my assessment of that or am I, am I off there and based on what you've researched and looked into? That's a great question, Lucas. Um, I think a lot of listeners might not have picked up on it that way, but I think how you articulated it is is very helpful, that there is an, an actual decision being made at times that if we're going to focus outwards, there's going to be consequences on the choices we make for our own families. And I'm not sure that we're even seeing that a lot of times or that it's being called out, brought to, brought to light. Um, so I would say that the two don't need to be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Um, God never uh, designed, whenever he makes a design for us, it's always going to be good for us and it's going to be good for the world. And um, if we are open to the gift of life as a family, then those children can be such a great blessing to this world. I'd say it's very unlikely that you're going to have too many relationships in life that will come anywhere close to the relationship that a parent has with their child in terms of influence. And of course, the most, um, the, the biggest priority in that relation should be that they come to know the Lord, that they, they know the Lord who gave them beautiful promises at their baptism. Uh, but by for sure, those children can also be agents that show the world how great our God is in evangelism, but also in caring for those um, seniors who are going to need a lot of care. So as a healthcare worker, for example, and in so many other ways, I think we make a mistake when we separate our call to evangelize or our our call to be missional, our call to be uh, relevant, when we separate it from the ordinary calling that God has given us. It is definitely a priority that we need to um, emphasize, but it's not distinct from um, where God has put us 
in our time and place. So if we trust that God is a good God and if he designed life this way, but he also put you and I and all the listeners exactly where they are intentionally, then our listeners, um, each of us, we don't need to fear. Are we being faithful to God or do I need to run to some other place in order to be faithful? There's this temptation in Christian circles uh, to think that we're going to be more effective if we're working for some ministry or if we're um, doing something that's a bit different, you know, something we can take a picture of and show to to others. Structure. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah. would say that the the if there's any stay-at-home moms listening, the stay-at-home mom is accomplishing exactly what this world needs, exactly what the church needs, exactly what each of us need. We need a you know, we need to um, come into this world. We need to be cared for. There is no higher calling than what the moms are doing. And it's very ordinary and there's not getting any attention. In fact, it gets a whole lot of uh, negative attention if it mm-hmm. does get attention. Uh, but it's exactly what this world needs. So, um, yeah, I hope that that kind of, I'm trying to make the case that it's not an either or. It's a but both it, and. Yeah, but it yeah. definitely should never come at the expense of how you said it of our our first calling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can be effective missionaries, like you say, just in our own home, like the stay at home mom or just yeah, dads too, like parents in general. It's a very, very important job. And yeah, and certainly stay at home moms get a lot of flack, but they, they shouldn't. It's I don't know, it's a it's a hard job. Well, if if there's any families listening who have, I'd say more than three children. You know what I mean when you when you have experienced walking through public with your children. Now, um, it's so striking. So we have six children. Last year we were on a trip on BC ferries. So I live in British Columbia, and we were just going from the mainland to Vancouver Island. I felt like our family was a tourist attraction on that boat. We almost um, stopped and and said, "Take pictures here," uh, because <laughs> you want to sign autographs. <laughs> yeah, there was not only was there very few children, but of the children, if there was any children, yeah, there was one, maybe two, and people couldn't believe that there was a family of this size. And it's not a negative thing. People smile. They say, "Way to go!" They're excited, and they say, "I wish I." had a big family. Mm -hmm. Uh, We experienced the same thing when we're camping, that our kids are down at the water playing. They're just having fun. And um, we go to the same camping spot each year, and it's a lot of seniors. They love it when our family shows up. They are so excited to see kids, and they get to know us by name. They are sad to see us go. One one fellow literally had tears in his eyes. And uh, I realized they're so lonely. So evangelize like we don't need to be um having some slick program or having the right name in our church or whatever else we need to just be faithful with what we have uh it's not just about having more children but with however many children if god has given us any um be be that salt be that light care for those who who god puts on our paths and our kids could be one of the greatest joys that somebody else experiences in a mm-hmm. day yeah Totally. That's a good way to put it. Are there some other um, recommendations or practicalities you can you can get into in terms of families nowadays having more children? I mean, like you have six kids. That is fantastic. But I feel like a lot of people listening, especially younger folks, will say that's a a lot of kids, which may be the mindset thing we talked about earlier. So that might need to be shifted. But B, economically, a lot of people say, Mark, I can't afford that. Like six kids. How am I going to get a vehicle to move six kids around? How am I going to get a house? More importantly, to house all these children and, and feed them all and send them to good Christian schools. Like this is it's a lot of a lot of money and, and effort. And does that mean mom has to go to work, right? And then mm-hmm. that that hurts family life. And there's all these trade offs nowadays in a in a country in an economy where it's the assumption is both parents are working in order to to make your mortgage payments and, and all your other bills. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you have any advice? Uh, should everyone move up to Smithers where it's a little cheaper maybe, or what's, what's the scoop there? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it's not quite as cheap as it was in Smithers. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I would say um, when the Lord says, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be yours as well. It's something we can take to heart that If we commit our ways to the Lord, he will be with us. He will provide for us. And so if we think that we need to um, take care of ourselves by saying no to something that God is is wanting to give us, we're going to be the ones who miss out. Um, So I'll I'll just back up a little bit, though, before, 
before speaking to, to, to that particular question of just how many more children and just acknowledge that um, my point is not to say that the goal is just to have as many children as possible. I'm not suggesting that at all. I also recognize that life is a gift from the Lord and in his wisdom, he doesn't give this to, to everybody. Some people would love to have children. He doesn't give them children. And that's a great um, burden. It can be a great uh, heartache. And, and uh, I don't mean in any way with this, this interview or with these presentations um, to suggest that um, those who the Lord does give life to are, have some um, advantage. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So my point is wherever the Lord puts us, he will provide for us. He will help us. He will take care of us. And for some people that is that they're single, they 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 either want to be single or they are um, just in a place in life where they are single, even if they would choose otherwise. And and it could still be a great blessing in God's kingdom. Um, my point of emphasis is not to say that the answer is just in having more children. It's rather. I'm saying this as a reaction to what we talked about earlier, the fact that so many people aren't prioritizing children, even though they could have children. Um, but to answer your question a bit more directly, I would start with um, the seniors or those who have adult children and say, um, are you talking to your kids about this topic? It, it's I find it because it's a sensitive issue, we tend not to talk about it, but you've been there before. You can help us out. Um, you can also share uh, from your own life, maybe your own regrets. I've had people pull me aside and say, Mark, I really, really regret taking measures to stop us from having more children. And if there's a message I could pass on, I would just want to share that. And uh, I thought, wow, that's, that's quite powerful to hear that from them. Um, and many times I don't think they're actually going to share that much more publicly. So if you have kids talk with them, or grandkids talk with them about this and, and listen to them. I don't mean, you know, talk down at them, but listen, what is it like for this generation as they navigate this, this reality? Um, for, for those who have children already and wonder if they could have more children, um, my, my encouragement would be to um, make this decision like all decisions, prayerfully, um, communicate well with your spouse and don't be in a rush to um, to make a decision based on how we feel today. So we we often feel overwhelmed. I know what that's like. You got kids around your feet when you're trying to take care of other kids and that's not a good time to make a decision. So if, if you're thinking about uh, a permanent, um, uh, you know, trying to come up with a, a permanent solution like a vasectomy or something like that, I'd say be very slow to make a decision like that. Um, because the consequences um, you might feel are the right decision for you. And two years later, you can be in an entirely different place. And uh, yeah, that doesn't allow for that. Um, but also, it, um, regardless of, of what practical measures that, that you might be taking, um, someone recommended, it was actually through a, a good podcast I heard, where they said, write out all the reasons that you have for either having more children or not having more children. and then put them on a grid, your own, just put on a you know, piece of paper with a pencil. And then right next to that reason, is this an example of faith, trust, or is this an example of selfishness or fear? And, and talk about it as a, as a couple, be honest because the, it's not ourselves. You know, when we make this decision, we feel like we're the ones who have to give account just to ourselves, but ultimately we're going to be giving account to the Lord. So um, is if this is based on fear, well, we know what the Lord says about fear. We know that he gives us promises to never leave us, to never abandon us. Um, on the, on the costs, on the, just the cost of having children, I think we have, we can learn a lot from, um, our parents and grandparents, especially those listeners from the Dutch reform tradition. You can see just how, um, stewardly things can be done with a large family. They don't necessarily need to have the cost that others assume comes from having more children. Uh, and also that's where we have the communion of saints. We can help each other out at some more expensive parts of our lives. And yes, I would say make a move. I don't mean just to places like Smithers, but it wasn't long ago and it was very common for families 
to have to move to a new location, like literally to go across the ocean, to go to a place where it's more um, possible to raise a family. Mm -hmm. And and I'd say it's, again, part of this expressive individualism to think that we can live right where we want to live, have the lifestyle we want to have. And I'd say it's okay to rent a house. We don't need to own a house. It's okay to have a smaller house. It's okay to um, just not put our kids into some of the same activities that others might put them in. Um, those things we all feel very directly firsthand. We feel like we're really hurting our kids in the moment. But when you zoom out, what do kids say that they want most? They just want your love. They just want the gift of life. They're thankful to be alive and they're thankful to have you. And they're often thankful to have siblings. I don't know about you. Oh, yeah. Um, but <laughs> that's great. I mean, I'm the oldest, so it was easy. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so true. It's so true. And yeah, I think, I think maybe where I feel like some people, so like I'm very much prime for this episode because I'm in the, that age group of like newly married, having children, whatever. So, and I think it, I agree with you and I would probably say it like even harsher. Like, I think there's a lot of selfishness in the hearts of my generation and I don't say this to any degree of pride or anything. Like I, it's, it's there in my heart too, from time to time it'd be a lot easier not to have kids or like to have more kids or whatever the plan is. And yeah, you could do a lot more things and it would be, it would be fun in the moment, but like, that's not what you're called to do. And I think we all have to take a good look in the mirror as young Christians in that situation and be like, look, like, like you say, is this, am I doing this out of faith or am I trying to serve myself? Is this a, a selfish act? I think where a lot of people, um, yeah, like let themselves off the hook as they say, well, I need to be financially stable and ready and whatnot. And then I think in today's current economic conditions, it just takes a lot longer to get there. So it's, it's this goalpost that conveniently gets pushed and pushed and pushed, whereas it's not a good metric to, to measure yourself by. And then number two, I would say, I, th- I very much agree on your point of like, if you need to make a move, you go make the move. Cause like what you're called to do is more important than your comfort and, uh, and, and yeah, personal belongings or like the, the things and the experiences you can have locally where you grew up. But I think where a lot of people get tripped up on that is that that was true throughout time. Like if you got to make a move, you make a move, there's war, famine, whatever. But I think our, for my parents' generation, that actually wasn't true. And you could, there was like this very like limited gap of time where you had like the baby boomers, they make the big move, come across to North America, settle down, their kids, Gen X, whatever. They're able to buy houses like next to mom and dad's or like in the same town, same area, you know, 20, 30 minutes away and they can raise their kids and they don't have to like, I'm not saying it wasn't hard for a lot of people. I'm sure it was to a degree, but the overall economic conditions made it such that like the nineties, early two thousands, even like early 2010s, like that was a good period to like, you know, buy house, raise kids. And it was not ridiculously unaffordable. Now we're entering a time where like there are more economic challenges and you need to make a bigger commitment of, of faith, honestly, just to, to go out and do that. And I think that is a challenge for, for a lot of young Christians. Yeah. In, in my age group and in, in, and around that age. So I have a lot of sympathy for that, but I do think it, it's a very important topic to talk to talk about because it's also one of them where like the clock is ticking too, right? And for people who are getting like into their thirties and farther and farther, and they maybe not have realized these pressures that are at play. Um, we do need to wake up as a church and say, Hey, like we have a role to play here and we need to, we need to take steps to, yeah, to be fruitful and multiply if God so wills and if we're put in that position. Um, So after that little diatribe, I want to come back to a question there. Um, Do you think this message is a little too pragmatic, maybe on its face? Are you worried about um, about that critique? And if so, um, how would you how would you address that? Just to to say if someone's like, Mark, you're just saying this because we need more people and you just do you want us? I know you said this earlier, but do you want us just to outbreed the Muslims or other Canadians or whoever else? What pick your group? Like, um, how do you address that? And how do you uh, put that in the sense that this is a, a timeless command from God? Yeah, well, I, th- I think it's probably come through already from what we chatted that it's not meant to be my opinion or reform perspectives. Uh, thoughts. It, this is what God has very clearly commanded the human race. It was him who, who said this to us, be fruitful and multiply. So that is pragmatic um, in a sense, but it, where it gets on its beautiful um, value is not just practical, it's eternal, it's spiritual. <laughs> Somebody was just visiting me last week and said, you know, for most things in life, 
um, it's true that you can't take it with you. The one exception is children. Um, that, of course, it's not entirely up to us, uh, the, their salvation, but for many, um, they can look forward to spending eternity with their family. And I thought <laughs> that's a, a beautiful way of putting it. But the, the point is simply that um, God gives uh, eternity into um, our hearts. He, every one of us is born temporal here, but we um, we do live into the life hereafter. So when your your decision to have a child is not just about how you're going to feel for the next five years or 10 years, it is the means through which God uses to bring new life into his kingdom. And I think we really lose perspective on that when it's all based on our how we're feeling or our circumstances or our finances, all those details. Um, and I, I would also say most people, not everyone, but most people who have um, been blessed with children will share my conviction. Um, so I've, my oldest is 15, close to turning 16 soon, but I would already testify that the greatest blessings that I've received in life, and I'm saying this um, across the board, the greatest blessings are not the ones that I've worked the hardest for. They're the ones that God has freely given. And I'd say in that list, um, obviously, first of all, is, is his promises. He gives me salvation, and, and that's, that's something I didn't work for, um, but also my children. And I've, I've worked um, pretty hard in this life already for some things. Um, practically, I, I did get a property uh, some years ago in northern BC. It's a pretty big piece of wild land that was very cheap. and. With my family, we worked it really hard to try to make it the kind of place where we could raise our family. It was a wild, dilapidated home homestead. Um, yeah, it, it was it was the kind of place where my office had you know occasional bears and moose and lynx walking by the window that I could show my webcam. Um, and what happened to that property? I gave it up. I sold it. I got rid of it. Probably bad timing as well. And we'd been renting for a few years since then. Um, how come? Well, because it's not a priority. It was getting in the way of being able to do what were my priorities. So raising my family, um, health, and uh, my work with, with ARPA, church commitments, uh, those things were, were priorities. Um, and, and the same is true of, of other things that, that we would be willing to give up. You know, all my studies, I don't care if someone took all my degrees or studies and just threw them away. It wouldn't matter in the least. But what matters by far the most already now, and I'm sure through the rest of my life, will be my wife and my children uh, and the promises of the Lord. And I look forward to doing this journey, however many more years God gives me. Um, I look forward to doing this journey with them at my side. And, and that's where I think older people feel much stronger about this topic. They see their kids and their grandkids making these decisions and they realize the lifelong consequences that comes. Because like you say, you have a limited window where you can have children. Once you're through that window, you could be a very lonely person uh, for the rest of your life. It's a, very, it's a very short window, actually. Well, I mean, less so for guys, but, you know, take the typical example. If you get married and say your wife's like a year or two younger than you, maybe, like still by the time you're both 40, like that's kind of it's kind of over for the yeah. most part, which yeah. is, I'm sure that goes very quickly. And if you don't get married till 25, it's a 15 year window. It's not a lot of time. Well, by the age of 30, if a woman hasn't had a child by the age of 30, the chances of her having any children is down to 50%. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. It's a small window. Yeah. Which, and yeah, uh, people definitely don't think about enough. I don't think if you're not, if you're thinking, ah, oh, marriage down the road, then it, it'll sneak up on you pretty quick. Okay. Um, well, I think we covered a lot on this topic. Is there anything else you want to, you want to touch on that's in your presentation that you want to let people know about? Like, yeah, just the overall, like, I guess people ask you to come make these presentations. I think we've, we've talked about the why a fair bit in terms of this is a, this is a problem. And as a world, we're not obeying God's command. And as a church, we are, uh, at risk of also not being his obeying his command if we continue along the trends that the world is going. Um, is there any any other details you wanted to talk about uh, in this topic? I think I would just um, want the the listeners to know that the point in talking about all of this and sharing it is to be an encouragement. Um, 
so many of the listeners, I think, are living this. They, their ordinary life in, revolves around their family. So a lot of guys are trying to provide for their families. They're trying to be a good dad or be, be a good grandpa. A lot of women are caring for their children, or if they don't have children, they're very involved in the lives of, of other children, so nieces, nephews. And my message to you would be, way to go. Uh, what you're doing is exactly what the Lord is calling us to. So sometimes um, we need to get back to basics. When I lived in that wild house, my parents gave me this book. It's an old classic from Reader's Digest called Back to Basics. And uh, it has all these practical suggestions on how to dig your own well, how to cook on a wood cook stove. And we had a wood cook stove, like oh, wood fired. And, wow. Wow. Um, all these practical things, and, and it's kind of become a rage among among many, I think, in society to go back to basics. Well, I'd say the basics for family life are just the humble, everyday service of loving and caring for your children. I think John Kelvin um, said it well. He uh, he called it a sweet, uh, sweet smelling sacrifice to the Lord when a mom is caring for her kids, bathing them, cleaning them, you know, changing their diapers. He didn't use the word diapers, but but uh, he called that a sweet smelling sacrifice. And he he did that in contrast to these women who were leaving um, this calling to go to convents. So it was popular back then. They thought it was worldly to have a family. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, no, no. What, what the Lord is calling us to is right in front of us. Uh, so I want to really encourage all those of you who are giving this your full effort. Sometimes it feels like life is, is very just, um, much the same. It's not very exciting. Well, it doesn't need to be exciting. We're doing hard work in the Lord's kingdom. And I think you'll experience the fruit of this for eternity. So persevere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meaningful things are not often exciting in the moment. And I'm sure it takes a long time and, and, and you would know that better than, better than I. Okay. Well, it's good. I think we should be encouraged. And yeah, that's, that's a good point to end on for, for this discussion because many folks are, are doing it as, uh, are following the Lord's commands. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I would just encourage any other young folks, you know, people my age or, or younger coming up, if you're not married or you're dating or whatever, just to, to consider this call to be fruitful and multiply and to make it a part of your conversations too, especially if you are dating and or engaged and whatnot. Like that's, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows this, but it's worth repeating. Like you should certainly have that conversation about children and the importance of that. And, and I don't know, actually, uh, this is a question I was going to ask you earlier. Do, so you and your wife have six kids. And, uh, this, I've heard this discussion from, from people my age before and people love to ask, Oh, how many kids do you guys want to have? Like, I feel like that's a question I've got a lot in like the last year. Actually, even uh, Reverend Ethan asked me that too. Um, did you guys set out to have six kids or you thought, let's just see what the Lord gives us and we'll, we'll play this as it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did not, um, set out to have any certain number of kids. I think it's actually, we have to be very careful when we talk like that because one one of the lessons that really struck me when I was given my first child by the Lord is, wow, this is not my child. This is clearly from the Lord. Like there's no way I could make this child. It's 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 a gift from God. It's a miracle. Um, so to presume another one or, and then a third one or what have you, I think um, is is not the kind of presumption we, we should make. We should see um, what the Lord has, has in store for us. And um, and be open to, um, yeah, have that conversation with your spouse. You're right. Even before marriage is, is really important. Um, but yeah, what I didn't say earlier on is, um, uh, there can be times where, uh, out of love for the commitments that we've already made. So we have made promises to our wife at marriage and to our children at their baptisms where out of, in order to fulfill those promises, there is wisdom in, um, not having more children or in waiting before you have more children. Um, I know that some people would take issue with me when I say that, but the greatest command to love God and to love our neighbor, I think it definitely uh, starts with those immediately around us, our, our families, and especially if our spouse is not uh, able for um, health reasons or emotionally just not able to have another child. We need to listen. Um, we need to be very caring. And if we just say, no, God says, be fruitful and multiply. then I do think God will hold us to account there uh, as well of, of loving the, the life he's already given us. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not an absolute command is what I'm, what I'm trying to say there. No, that's true. It has to be balanced with your other commitments. And I mean, especially as in the husband and wife dynamic, right? Where husbands are called to love their wives and yeah, you shouldn't be, uh, yeah, you should have a very long conversation about that, I think. So, okay, cool. I think we've kind of hit most of what we want to talk about on that topic. Uh, we promised listeners a quick update on uh, Reform Perspective, the journey of RP. So you've been involved for, yeah, it's probably right about two years at this point. Um, tell us tell us a little about the, the story. I mean, I kind of know a bit from the inside. I sit on the board with you, but it's been uh, quite the change from where we were, yeah, two, three, four years ago. And uh, it's very exciting. Just for anybody watching on YouTube, I'm holding the latest edition of Reform Perspective right up here. And uh, featured prominently on the cover is uh, our new uh, initiative, RPTV. So I think that is, a, is it a weekly program, Mark? Weekly program of, of news and updates um, from a Christian point of view here in Canada. So it's very, very exciting to see that. And uh, that's been, uh, yeah, lately for me, I've been, uh, yeah, just very pumped and excited about that because it's such a rare commodity in this country. So you want to give the listeners a little uh, preview of yeah everything else that's kind of been going on. Yeah, I think in many ways, a reform perspective won't seem that different to those who have been seeing it for for uh, many years. We still try to publish a good quality print magazine. Mm-hmm. I've loved the work that uh, the editor John Dykstra has done for years uh, in challenging us and sh- uh, sharpening us when it comes to how does God's word apply to the issues of the day. He always says, you know, the other six days of the week, not not just yeah, on yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Um, so we, we're trying to maintain. You know, what? whatever the, the founders of RP, the vision they had 40 years ago, my hope would be that they're thrilled with, with where it's at today, that it doesn't feel that different. Where it's changed is a lot more people are exposed to the, the print magazine now. Uh, it used to be, go to about 1,500 homes when it was subscriber-based. Now it goes to over 10,000 homes. And uh, I picture it as like an NHL arena. If each, if each issue is being read by two people or sometimes more than two people, that's comparable to, you know, the where the Toronto Maple Leafs play or where the Vancouver yeah, Canucks Scotia play. Bank or whatever, yeah. It, right back yeah. to capacity with everybody reading mm-hmm. the same, um, hopefully wholesome material. And and uh, that, that does, does a number of things. It can promote unity among uh, Christian churches. It can promote faithfulness. That's what we really hope for with, with the magazine. Um, it can also help us to celebrate what God is doing. We try to have a very positive tone in, in the pages of the magazine. God is doing amazing things through his people and in this world. And we want to not just talk about some of the more challenging things in life, but also beautiful things like the arts. There's an artist profile in there now. So we've added a number of new sections. There's a kid section that's it's definitely a kid section. It's designed by um, a woman named Stephanie Vanderpool in uh, BC, and she does a fantastic job of um, making it a part of a magazine the kids want to open up and they want to read. Um, and then another change that people might have noticed is a, a increasing focus on journalism. So where we get onto the street, so to say, um, to try to come up with a new story, a story that we think needs to be heard, needs to be written, uh, and and we put that out both in the print magazine and and online in a variety of other mediums. Um, so yeah, it's reaching more people. It's coming in through a few other, um, mediums. We've added, uh, uh, another devotional. We've already had a devotional, uh, on our app. The RP has an app for the, for those who are, um, willing to, to try it out. There's actually 17,000 users. So it's quite popular. It's mm-hmm. got the Bible on it. It's got real talk. <laughs> it's well worth it in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and it has a daily devotional that the near to God folks who produce that, that little booklet monthly devotional, uh, we put it into electronic form. Uh, so it's an easy way to, um, start the day off right by, by going to God's word. Uh, and then it also has things like RPTV. So that's, um, what, what you were just talking about, Lucas, that the most recent initiative that we started is, is, uh, an effort to get into video in a big way. So Alexandra, um, Allison, she's, uh, our journalist, she's based in Ottawa right now. She's an intern with ARPA. Um, she has experience already. She, she works for world, uh, news group world, uh, magazine is a bit of an inspiration for, for us. Um, they're based down in the U.S. She did the world journalism program just like myself and John Dykstra and Marty Vendriel. We've all gone through that. And so she got connected with us 
Um, she's also a Reformed Christian. And so she was excited that, hey, there's there's some others who are working on promoting Christian journalism in Canada. And she recently finished her um, degree in journalism and even completed a, a, a some work experience at the CBC. So in this most recent issue, you'll find an article about her her uh, six weeks at the CBC, what that was like. In the lion's den. Yeah. 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 Right yeah. And so she's producing a weekly video. Um, two guys uh, faith from Faith to Film who are also, I know, um, being pro profiled on uh, Real Talk. They are the ones producing it into a very quality video. So we try to keep it to about five minutes each week. And you can find it on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, um, on, on our website, nrptv.ca. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would pitch it to the listeners like, um, you're not going to go to RP to get your breaking news. That's not what we're trying to do. But you will go there to get a quality long form well, in medium form to a degree, I suppose. But you'll get a quality take that is uh, takes a step back, looks at the issue uh, broadly, and then dives into it and gives you, uh, yeah, just like I quality would be the kind of the word of the day there, just a quality Christian um, perspective, a reform perspective on the news of the day, and uh, and that in and of itself is incredibly valuable because it's very very hard to find um, in this country. So. Yeah, I'm very excited about uh, the direction RP is heading, and um, yeah, the future looks bright. So, if there's any other young uh, or young or old, honestly, anybody who's aspiring to uh, to get into the realm of journalism or has an idea for for where RP can go and, and expand in this realm, we're always open to suggestions and uh, and looking for new talent. So, feel free to send in uh, send in your application, and and you can meet Mark and and meet the rest of the team. So, I think that's probably it from my end. You got any final parting thoughts, Mark, for for our listeners? Well, I just want to thank all the, all, all you listeners. You um, have been fantastic when it comes to spreading the word also about this podcast. So Real Talks Initiative of, of Reform Perspective. Lucas is also a board member for Reform Perspective. And um, these efforts, things like Real Talk and RP Magazine and RP TV, they only go places when you, the, the viewers, listeners, um, are willing to to be edified, but then spread the word. Uh, so you've done that. A lot of you, I know, I hear about it um, regularly. Hey, have you listened to that that episode on on Real Talk? Um, or they share it on church social, or they sh- if they're an elder, they share it with uh, someone in their ward. Um, thank you for tuning in each time. Thank you for spreading the word. And a lot of you have also come behind this work um, financially with support. We're very grateful for that. Reform Perspective is donor-driven, um, so we can only do our work thanks to to uh, donations. So really appreciate that and want to wish uh, each of you strength and the Lord's blessing as you, yeah, faithfully serve wherever he's put you. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. And one actually final note on the other podcast, uh, RP has Mana. That's a daily devotional podcast. I've been enjoying that myself. Got into that a few months back and it's usually right around the 10-minute mark and Personally, I just throw on my headphones and walk the dog in the morning and that's how I start my day and I enjoy it. It's kind of a, it's an interesting mix. It's uh so it's uh, we have the library of the voice of the church and now that's been put into podcast form and, and it just gets rolled out. So it's interesting because you do get some slightly dated references based on when it came out. Like uh, the, the, the one that I've been listening to the last couple of days, they've been referencing uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle and the whole Royals and so, which is quite interesting, but uh, yeah. It's enjoyable. It's edifying. It's a it's a great way to start your day. So I'd highly recommend checking out the Mana podcast. Found wherever podcasts can be found on, on whatever network you use. So in the RP app, you'll find it there too. And in the RP app, seventeen thousand other people are using it. So get on board. Righto. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, listeners. Um, just to quickly echo, yes, we're very humbled by your continued support, and uh, the podcast continues to just steadily grow bit by bit week by week and largely that is almost entirely actually of just word of mouth we don't put much advertising power behind it other than putting in the magazine and and sharing it online so thank you very much uh to each and every one of you and yeah keep having real conversations keep learning that's what we're trying to do here and uh with that i think uh, we'll call it there so keep having real talk until next time Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch the show. If you want to send us your feedback, and we'd love to hear it, please email us at reformedrealtalk 
at gmail.com. If you want to find us online or social media, we've got a lot of great content there. Just search Reformed Real Talk and we should come right up. This show is created and produced by myself, Lucas Holtfluer, and Tyler Vanderwood. And our wonderful podcast manager who does all the editing is Mariah Tamiga. So we're really thankful for her contribution to the show as well. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.